is it? Bum, ba, da, ba. You're locked into the flagship, an Ole Miss podcast powered by College Corner. Here we go. One, two, three. Get your daily Rebel sports fix at the Ole Miss Spirit, omspirit.com. Welcome in to the flagship, Wednesday, August 28th. I'm your host, Zach Berry. Uh, we've got another jam-packed recruiting show for you. Lots of uh, Caleb Cunningham talks and uh, a couple big-time 2026 targets will be on campus this weekend for Ole Miss's season opener against Furman, 6 p.m. Central Time uh, in the Vaught. Before we bring in our guests, I do want to remind you, this show each and every day, you know by now, but we got to we gotta remind you. It's brought to you by College Corner, our good friends, Ridgeland, Oxland, Oxford, and Flowood. Uh, and if you can't get to any of the three stores, you can check them out, collegecornerstore.com. Our main man, Scott, takes care of us, and he will take care of you. You can get some new merch. You can get tailgating supplies, all of that to get ready for the 2024 season. That is College Corner and collegecornerstore.com. All right, without further ado, the one, the only Cody Belair is back with us here. Cody, good afternoon and a happy week one. No doubt, man. Isn't it? It's I tell everybody when we talk about stuff like this, like it really does feel like Christmas Day. Yeah. And I know that's sort of an exaggeration, but do you not get excited? Like week zero, I was fired up when I woke up in the morning because I knew college game day was going to be put on my TV. Like I was jazzed, yeah. like super it, fired up about it. Yeah, it was great. Um, I don't know if my in-laws did it intentionally, but they took the kids okay. <laughs> for us. So we had a, oh, a kid free weekend. Uh, oh, so wow. Parents, Good for you. Yeah, like Saturday, slept in, watched college game day, watched the first half at Georgia Tech, Florida State. Second half, we walked down the road to the, uh, the local tavern. Shout out, yeah. Roy. And uh, watch the second half, and yeah, I mean, it was it was fantastic. It, it's it's going to be different this week, obviously, with a full slate, but no doubt, it, it felt good to be back last weekend. Yeah, it really did, man. I mean, and the thing is, all the games that were on like big time TV were good. All of them went down to the wire, like New Mexico game two and Montana. Like that was a great game. So, like, if it's anything close to what Week Zero was, I mean, Week One's going to start off with a with a bang. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. We've got I mean five straight days of football. Uh, I'm not Can't sure. Complain. Can yeah, I complain? <laughs> this this will probably come out Thursday. Mm. So if it did, if it does, then yeah, this is day one of five straight days. Um, Beautiful. All the way to to Monday, where Florida State's got to get back off the mat against a uh, a hungry Boston College team. No so. doubt. And I mean, you got to think right, like. Florida State. I mean, we talk about must wins all the time. That is a must win it's, of must win. <laughs> especially, it's weird to say that in a twelve in a year where the twelve team playoff is a thing. So, like, oh no question, one game, especially with conference champions, power four conference champions, all get in. So mm-hmm. Florida State could still win the ACC, but it does very much feel like a must win game in in week. You know, it's it's week two for them. We call it week right. one, but yeah, right. it's it's tough. I I felt really good uh, leading up to week zero. I was hammering mm-hmm. the under. I was I was like, look, man, I know Brent Key. He is gonna really just dial this game back to nineteen eighty four. Yeah, and right. Is gonna, is gonna play keep away, play good <laughs> defense, run the football, and yeah, my God, he did. Um, I, uh, I, I laid off the, uh, the betting on, on week zero, you know, I had to give myself some grace being like, look, dude, just sit and watch the games, enjoy yourself, whatever. But I tell you what, I redownloaded that prize pick app yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I am geeked up for week one. I, I yeah, I told, uh, I, I told my wife last week, I was like, this is like a national, like, oh shit, what's my password day? For like yeah. draft kings and stuff, like <laughs> everybody hit, hit, forgot your password link. Yeah, no uh, question. I dude, I had to, I had to hit support to redeposit funds into my account <laughs> just to be like, hey, I know it's, it's been a minute. I'm struggling over here, and yeah. luckily, I am, I'm squared away and good to go now. So fired up for week one. Yeah, we're locked in. Um, speaking of locked in, 
Uh, five-star Alabama commit Caleb Cunningham locked in for this weekend. He will be in Oxford for the game. I, look, I say all the time, like, old-school recruiting still exists. Follow mm-hmm. the visits, man. Um, still committed to Alabama. Alabama is, you know, they hold his commitment. They are the leader. Everyone is chasing Alabama. But the guy keeps showing up in Oxford. He's still very intrigued. Um, I wanted to have you on because I wanted to talk a little bit about because he told me in July it was it was Alabama and Ole Miss. I know okay. Auburn's in the peripheral. Uh, LSU's kind of hanging around. Mississippi State's going to keep trying. But th- this is straight from Caleb Cunningham. He said that it was Alabama, Ole Miss. He was going to take OBs to both. Um, sure. Looking at those two programs, and I do think there are a ton of similarities and there are, there are some differences. I think both Kalen DeBoer and Lane Kiffin pride themselves on rough football first and foremost um, right both have a lot of talented receivers that have put up big numbers and quarterbacks that put up big numbers lord knows michael Penix had mm-hmm. himself a year and uh, jackson dart also had a great year in, in 2023 but looking at kind of you know i don't want you to say which one is the best fit but just comparing sure. the two offenses and historically what receivers have looked like at each. Um, yeah. How do you, if you're, if you're talking to Caleb and like, all right, let's sit down and let's, let's get, let's hit the film hard yeah. and let's look at how Alabama compares to Ole Miss and vice versa. What would you say? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I, I think it's sort of a conversation you have to say where you go, okay, look, historically the types of guys that have thrived at these places, right at Alabama, you're looking at most recently guys like AJ Brown, you know, uh, DK Metcalf, there's bigger physical type of wide out. Right. And in Alabama, you're looking at the more leaner athletic top end speed guys. You know, that's Ryan Williams this year that the Alabama signed. And then there's guys like Devonte Smith in the past, Jerry Judy in the past, Henry Ruggs. Those guys are taking the top off of defenses consistently, but, it's a little different conversation when you talk about Kalen DeBoer and what he was able to do at Washington and the type of offense that I think he's going to bring to Alabama. And honestly, here's the deal. If I'm being completely honest with, with the kid, you're probably not going to go wrong either way, right? When you look at what DeBoer's done offensively and what Kiffin's done offensively, DeBoer can point to Roma Dunze. I, I really do think when you look at body type, physicality, athleticism, that's a great little comp for Caleb Cunningham. That's the way they win vertically, the way they win getting in and out of breaks. They're great athletes, but they're a football attackers. And that's what Caleb Cunningham does best. He attacks the football. And I think Roma Dunze is a great comp. But on the other side of it, the guy that I know Ole Miss folks are really excited to see this year is Trey Harris, the kid that came from La Tech. I mean, You go and look at Trey Harris as a high school prospect. Him and Caleb Cunningham are borderline identical. Go watch those guys dunk a basketball. They look like clones of each other. And by the way, may I touch on this? If you have not seen Caleb Cunningham's dunk package, please go and Google Caleb Cunningham dunks only right now and then come back. Because for the next five minutes, you will be glued to that screen. His bounce, his explosiveness, that's what you see carry over to the football field. The way he high points the ball, the way he fights for extra yards, he really is a treat to watch. And to be honest with you, Zach, he can't go wrong at either place. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We were talking about it before we hit record. Uh, I think people, well, you got a glimpse of it in in the, quote, spring game. Right, Ole Miss had a dunk contest, and and Trey Harris has has flashed it. You know, you see it on the sidelines when they dunk after a touchdown. I, right, <laughs> I, I can trust but verify that it's a ten foot goal. I don't think it is. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean they're doing some some windmills, they're doing some three sixties, some you know off the backboard one hand punches. But yeah, I, I think that's that's where Caleb Cunningham kind of supplements the lack of the top end home run speed where he can just jump over you. Um, I think that's big for him. And, mm-hmm. and look, I'd say, you know, top, you know, he lacks top end speed. Caleb Cunningham can still run, but I mean, he's right. not a burner, like you said, like a Devonte Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it, that's a question I wanted to to ask you because it is kind of getting down to where, you know, both places are great. Mm-hmm. Both coaches are great. Both coaches put guys in the NFL. 
uh, Caleb Cunningham talked to uh, our very own Steve Wolfong this week, and that's what he said about Ole Miss. He was like, they they put guys in the league, and that's important um, to him. A lot, of guys, a lot of guys it's not, but it's important to him. Yeah, and, and you know, the other part of that deal that you can't necessarily point to as an analyst or, you know, even doing what we do is especially the and the guys in those buildings understand this. You can point at stats and point at history and point at, hey, this guy went to the league, this guy, we do great with receivers that do this, 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 the other half of it too. And I know, Zach, you know this. And obviously this way is different with every kid is how do you feel walking in the building? How you feel walking on campus? What does it mean to you? You know, and I've talked about this previously on on shows with you, Zach. Is the the home cooking means a lot to these kids, man? Mississippi and the state and in, in the schools there, it's really tough to leave. Historically, I remember when I was working at LSU, that was the state of Mississippi and the kids that come from there love those schools they love them and the schools love them back it is really difficult for in-state mississippi kids to go elsewhere so you know it, it, it's some it's a part of the game that we can't really attest to or really understand outside looking in because that's a feel thing you know i don't know how caleb cunningham feels when he walks on Ole miss's campus i don't know how he feels when he walks in tuscaloosa but that's the other half of the equation that you just got to hope they're doing their job on the recruiting side of things. Yeah. When I talked to Caleb earlier this spring, it was after his kind of first meeting with new wide receiver receivers, coach George McDonald. And mm. he said they hit it off. He said it was a great meeting. He said that, that he immediately trusted him and yeah. he knows about um, his time at Illinois where he put a couple guys in the league and, and he's been doing it for a long time. And I think that's crucial where, like like we said, old school recruiting, where you get down to where you like one or two or three schools, mm -hmm. kind of have to look at those variables, right? Where all right, oh, all the totally. NIL, all the NIL packages are pretty even. Um, they're both in the SEC. They're both top ten programs right now. Both have great head coaches, good quarterbacks. Then you got to start mm -hmm. looking at okay relationships. Like you said, how do you feel in the building? How do you feel in in town? Um, you know, how, how do your parents feel about, you know, who you're around and things like that? I, I think that's where um, you mentioned the, the in-state pool. Um, you know, does he want to stick around like a DK Metcalf, like an AJ Brown? Um, you know, those, those two guys could have gone anywhere. Right. Could have, could, yeah, have, and could have gone anywhere, but they, they chose to stay home. So how big of a factor is that? Um yeah. So it's it's going to be a fun a fun one to to track until the very end. But yeah, yeah I, think, that, <laughs> I think Ole Miss. It's very clear now because of the visit, and right? He said as much like Ole Miss is in it more than people think. Yeah, and, and I think that's the thing that it stings for either the either way it goes, you know, Zach. But whoever finishes second in this race is it's going to be close. I it's it's yeah. going to cut either way. Like whoever he signs the dotted line with, it's. It ain't going to be an easy decision, and it, you're going to be close no matter how you slice it. So it's a fun one, man. The, the good ones are tough to lose on, but God, it feels so good when you get them in the boat. And look, like, finish second. You know, maybe you finish first in a year or two with the portal. Hey, no doubt. Portal. So. I mean, that's, to your point, Zach, that's honestly one of the biggest things, and that's something coaches have – reached on like the good coaches and some of the good staffs that I've talked to mention that like, you know, there's some kids that commit early and, you know, they go through this recruiting process and some schools shut it down. Like once a school, once a kid commits to a program, some schools say, Hey dude, lost cause we're done. We're not going to talk to that kid anymore. Uh -huh. The good ones do not do that because they understand that recruiting process could pick right back up where it left off. If that kid enters the portal, like that game's not over. It never is until yeah. that dude is getting his name called like on the NFL draft stage. It is not over. You never know how this shakes out. One of the, um, we we're talking about NFL lineage for Ole Miss at the wide receiver position. Um, one of the big feathers in Kiffin's cap is Elijah Moore and what he did with him in a couple of years and, you know, took him from a, and Elijah Moore was a four-star from a great mm -hmm. high school program down at St. Thomas Aquinas that, my God, they put dudes in the league every single year. Um, 
but yeah, just turned him into, oh, by the way, he's going to, you know, break every record. He's going to, you know, be a, just a dominant possession receiver in the SEC. Um, a lot of similarities to a 2026 guy that will be on campus this weekend in Vance Spafford. Um, I talked with Chad Simmons earlier this week on the show, and, mm -hmm. you know, you were there. I probably asked you four or five times when we were at the OT7 finals. I was just like, who is this kid? Like, he is – he is open all the time and he's getting in the end zone nonstop. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was going to touch on. I mean, this is a 2026 guy, Zach, that's got legit speed. And to your point, I don't know if I saw a 2026 like the field on fire more this past offseason than Vance Spafford. Like, he stood out in a big way at every single event that he went to. I mean, that was at Under Armour camps, future 50, seven on seven, OT seven, like you mentioned, you name it, he smoked it. Like he went to the future 50 camp this summer. And after putting on a clinic as a route runner, right? He went ahead and won the fastest man competition with a laser four, three, five after the workout, which emphasis on after the workout, he ran four, three laser. Like, He's the real deal. Like, he's got soft hands. He tracks the ball effortlessly. We just really like the way he plays the receiver position. He gets open, and he catches the football, and he has the ability to stretch the field vertically. Everyone in the country wants a guy like that. So, yeah, I could gush on Vance Bafford for a while, man. He's he's a dynamite player. Yeah, I think the uh, yeah the laser 4-3-5 is special. Um, I, that you can't, you know. You've been in the you've been in the industry. You can't teach that. Not um, normal. Yeah, not yeah. normal. Um, he put up monster numbers last year, um, and we'll get to it in a moment. In an offense that rotated quarterbacks every series, which I yeah. think doesn't get talked about enough. I mean, sure, you practice with those two guys every day, but having that rapport and that chemistry with two separate quarterbacks who were different, and yeah. still, I think he had twenty two receiving touchdowns a year ago, and Mission Viejo mm -hmm. won a state championship. Um, so yeah, the bona fide dude, uh, this isn't some, you know, well, you know, he's just really fast. That's about it. No, mm -hmm. it was carving people up at OT. Absolutely. Runs yeah. I mean, really, like the maturity of the route tree is impressive. That's what I was going to touch on. Zach. I mean, do you have guys that are fast? Like there's, there's plenty of fast guys out there. This guy's a master at getting open. That's the name of the game. We we like to overcomplicate things. And, you know, you look at all these kind of data sets and these data points and what you're asking to do from a technical perspective. But at the end of the day, dude, the receiver position is about getting open and catching the football. Like, that's what it is. That's what you're asking these guys to do. And Vance does that. Yes, having elite speed is helpful, obviously. But my goodness, the way he gets on guys' toes and gets in and out of his breaks and can sink in and out of his routes, like that kid just knows how to get open. And ultimately, that's going to open doors for him at every level of his career because that's the name of the game at the receiver position. All the guys get faster. All the guys get bigger. All the guys get stronger. But my goodness, when it comes from a technical perspective and what this kid's able to do, in terms of getting and sinking in and out, like his hips, his hip fluidity is so good. And it's just, I mean, I get emotional talking about Vance Spafford, <laughs> his ability to run routes just because he's so crisp and clean and zero wasted movement. It's a, it's a delight to watch, man. It's, it's gonna, it's gonna make a lot of Ole Miss fans cringe, but I do want to steal a, a steal a line from a former Ole Miss legend, Phil Longo, where, to a certain extent, you're chasing space, right? Like you're yeah. For for his position, he's he's running a route, but like OT7, I think like when people say, Well, that's not real football. No, there's a lot you can take from those events. Where a thousand percent. When things break down, you can see who is just fast and who can play ball. Where mm -hmm. like he he knows how to get open. He knows where the quarterback is looking, where he's going. He knew where the sticks were. Um that sort of stuff is hard to teach. Like you can, you can try to hammer it into someone's head, but some of that's just kind of innate. Um, right. It kind of reminds me, you, you brought up a good point where like he's, he's fast, but like he knows how to use it. 
where I remember coaching baseball where it was like, there's a difference between guys that throw fast and guys that right. throw hard. Right. And I think in, in football, if it was all about just having fast guys, then yeah. all these dudes that were in Paris on the 100, you know, meter, you know, yeah. whatever, right. those guys would just play football too. Right. Cause it, right. they're fast. No, like you, you got to be able to harness it and know how to, you know, like you said, when to break down, when to take the top off and stuff like that. I think like he already has such a, a mature approach to playing the position Mm -hmm. and you know, look, it certainly helps that he's been playing with Luke face since they were like five years old. Um, No doubt. So it it helps when your best friend's the quarterback. Um, Yeah, for sure. But uh, to your point, Zach, the analogy I like to use is it's the difference between a drag racer and an F one driver. When you're doing a drag race, you're pressing the gas and going. That is it. Your green light goes and you just go as fast as you possibly can, pedal to the metal, gone. F1 driver, you're throttling up and down constantly, in and out of curves, in and out of creases. That's the way you have to operate as a wide out. And there are some receivers that are drag racers, and that's great. You can be fast and be a one-trick pony. But the real deal wide outs are the ones that can be F1 drivers, the guys that get in and out of turns and know how to throttle up and throttle down. We brought up Luke Fahey. Um so yeah. let's move over to him. He will be in town this weekend with his teammate, Vance Bafford. Uh, both of them were scheduled to be in town for Juice Fest in July. They couldn't make it. Um, so this will be Fahey's first time in Oxford. I, look, if you're an Ole Miss fan, not only should you be excited about Caleb Cunningham, Luke Fahey, Vance Bafford being in town. Right. should also be very excited about – I think there's going to be some very pointed play calling on Saturday where – Look, all due respect to the Paladins, and look, it's a good FCS program, but I think Lane Kiffin's going to have some fun with the play calling on Saturday to showcase, hey, Vance, why don't you, why don't you watch Jordan Watkins on this one? Why don't you watch Juice Wells on this one? <laughs> um, you know, hey, hey, Caleb, like keep an eye on number nine all, all, all evening. So yep. I think that's exciting. But um, from a quarterback perspective, I have a comp for – Fahey, so I'll give it to you Ooh. after you kind of give your thoughts on him. We got a okay. good look. At, we got a good look at him at OT seven finals. California yes. Power got to the final four. He was really impressive. Um, but just his his high school career up to this point has been very interesting. With uh, mm-hmm. the aforementioned, you know, rotating every series. So before you give your scouting report as an evaluator, okay, how do you go about? Ev- you and Charles go about evaluating something. I know that's not the case with a lot of kids across the country, but right. like that, that rotation, every series, I know Chad Johnson, the head coach at Michigan Viejo is adamant. That's how they, they won a state championship with it last year. So it's obviously working, but how different is it to evaluate that? Yeah, it's, it's obviously tough because you want as much clip, you want as many clips as you possibly can. You want to see as much game film as you possibly can for these guys. So, when QBs are going in and out of series and stuff like that, it makes it tough from a consistency standpoint. I think that's the toughest part of that, obviously for the kid, right? I mean, you can't really get in a rhythm, but for us on the evaluation side of things, you you're getting half the reps and you're not able to really see how they string drives together. Right. A big thing too, you know, with, with quarterbacks in particular, it's that short memory, right? Like that's something that we talk about with Philip Rivers all the time. His ability to air it out, throw a bomb, throw in a traffic, throw a pick. Ah, eh, forget it. I don't even remember it happened. Next play, next series, whatever. And you see how he's able to bounce back. With, with guys that are rotating in and out of series and stuff, you don't really get to see the resiliency part of it. You don't really get to see the bounce back. They get a whole series to go cool off and go over what happened and what they miss. And then they go back in a series later. So resiliency and consistency in terms of evaluating the positions a little tougher, but at the end of the day too, a lot of the, a lot of the emphasis when you're scouting, especially younger prospects like 2027s and 26s and guys going into their sophomore and junior years, it's about traits, right? Physical traits, athletic traits, arm talent. You can still see that when guys are rotating in and out. Um, but in terms of consistency and being able to respond to adversity, it does make it a little tougher when guys are rotating in and out. I talked with with Luke earlier this week about mm-hmm. this weekend, and, and he's excited to to finally get to Ole Miss and to see a game. Uh, he did tell me, so this will be good for for you and Charles. He did tell me next year he will not be rotating with anyone. Nice. Uh, so he'll be good for him. 
he'll be the upperclassman. So you'll get a full, you'll get a full season of, of Luke Fahey. But um, so looking at him in terms of how he projects to college into the NFL, um, mm. kind of the things that jump out to me and we saw it at OT seven quick processor and yep. can really make plays when things break down when he's mm. off platform on the move, things like that. But how do you evaluate him as a signal caller for college and NFL down the road? Yeah, I think when we look at the group as a whole, the 26 cycle in general is not crazy top heavy at this point, but I do think it's a deep group. I think there's about 30 quarterbacks right now that are in that 92 to 87 range, you know, low four star, high three star that we think have a shot to light it up on the field going into their junior seasons. And Luke Fay, he's one of those guys. I think, you know, we had the pleasure of seeing him throw it around this past off season, right? This is a kid that's got a more stout frame and build six, one, 200 ish pounds. He's built pretty similarly to a guy like Baker Mayfield, right? And the things that I like so much about Fahey and you touched on it, right? It's the ability to create, but I think the part of it that we really need to emphasize is the processing and the ability to place the football. I think he does a great job of throwing with anticipation and throwing his guys open. Plus, he's got high-quality arm talent. And uh, this is somebody that has the physical tools and the ability to maneuver the pocket. I think the biggest question mark that, you know, I I'm glad you mentioned that he's going to get a majority or a big bulk of the snaps going into his junior season, but it's the consistency, right? You know, to have a bad throw or, you know, how often is this guy throwing the throwing the ball in the bucket? Right. I, I think Fahey has a shot to grow in that side of his game with more repetition. And the fact that he's able to process so efficiently already with half the snaps that some of these other guys are getting is extremely impressive for his age. So I think he's got a real shot to rise up. I think I think this junior season will tell will tell us a lot about his growth and his development at the position. I, I do really like the Baker Mayfield comp, um, which I mean, who wouldn't? The guy won a Heisman Trophy, right? Very good. Um, now, social media memes aside, um, he reminds me a lot of Russell Wilson. Mm. Um, just I don't like hate that. Very mm -hmm. cerebral. Uh, Chad was Chad saw him last weekend in their opener against Santa Margarita Catholic, and he said it. He was like, he looks so like composed all the time, mm -hmm. like he's scrambling around. It's not frantic. He's very right. relaxed. That was always kind of my take on Russell Wilson. Like when he was in college at NC state and at Wisconsin before he got to the NFL, he just mm -hmm. always looked like he was in control. Um, and I think that that's kind of what you see with, with Luke when he's, when he's playing quarterback is yeah. it, everything is manageable. Like it's, it's not like a, you know, Fran Tarkenton, run around in circles type thing. He's he, like you say, a quick processor. So he knows, all right, here's my first read. All right. Next progression, next progression, mm -hmm. tuck it and run, throw it away. Like all of that is, is really hard to teach. Right. And it seems like he's already pretty far ahead of the game in that area. So yeah, the stocky build very, you know, Russell Wilson adjacent, but right. yeah, just, I don't know. Just, the quick release, a little bit like Russell. Uh, Russell's mm -hmm. probably a little bit longer. Luke's probably a little bit quicker. But, um, yeah, I mean, I thought about Jalen Hurts too, but I think Hurts is probably a little bit, a little More bit thicker. premier athlete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I mean, yeah, these, the, these comps we're throwing out ain't bad. No, right. And I, I think the thing that's really important to emphasize with all this is his ability to sense pressure and feel pressure. That is almost impossible to teach and i think he has that in in droves right in bunches and the fact he's able to maneuver and show and show that on tape right he shows that on tape the fact he's able to do that with limited game reps shows you just how innate that ability is because that's something that's hindered a lot of talented quarterbacks in the past i remember being around some prospects that were extremely highly gifted, right? Highly rated kids, all the arm talent in the world, all the physical attributes, and they get thrown into the fire and they start getting smoked in the pocket, right? They start getting hit from the blind side and they crumble. They start seeing ghosts for the rest of their career. And 
if Luke Faye is someone is someone that can feel that pressure now and sense sort of the way gaps open and how he knows when to climb and knows when to escape. If he can do that now with the limited reps he's getting, there's a chance he could do some serious damage at the next level and beyond. He's he's got a real shot. Yeah, I, and look, I we don't have to say it on a show for people to know, but maybe we'll say it for the people in the back. Link Kiffin knows what he's doing when he's recruiting quarterbacks. Um, if it, if you're getting an offer from Lane Kiffin and you're getting invited to a game by Lane Kiffin, there's a reason. Right. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the 2026 group for the most part, a lot of those top quarterbacks have already found a home. I think mm-hmm. out of the top 10, I think Ryder Lyons is the only one that is still uncommitted. Um, which coincidentally Ole Miss is after him as well. But Special. um yeah. Yeah, I think the it's going to be interesting to keep track of this year because and look we we can't do a you know recruiting podcast without mentioning Deuce Knight. Um <laughs> but look it's been talked about plenty. It's pretty much Deuce Knight or no one in this class for Ole Miss because mm. of the, the room being so deep already. Right. But I, I think that you're going to see a, a lot more of a concerted effort to go after the 26 guys. And it looks like it's Luke Fahey and Ryder Lyons at the top of the list. Yeah. I mean, those are strong too. And I, I think the way Deuce Knight ends up is going to be extremely interesting. I mean, for us, from a rankings perspective, he, I mean, out of borderline every player in the country, Deuce Knight has more riding on his senior season than a lot of other guys, just because we have seen the flashes for so long, the athleticism, the size, the arm talent, we've seen it all. We know the way he throws the football. We know the way he can run around and create. We need to see it happen consistently on tape. That's been the biggest issue of his career to this point. And I think, if Deuce Knight can string a senior season together, extremely similar to the DJ Lagway situation a year ago, right? DJ Lagway was the same deal. Physical, athletic freak show, had a rocket attached to his shoulder, but he was a 50, 60% passer. Come senior year, I think that kid was throwing 70% or close to it and threw for like 4,000 yards. Like it's something ridiculous, but his production as a senior was finally the culmination of all this what if, if he's able to get it together, can he develop? Yes, yes he can, and he proved it as a senior. With Deuce Knight, that is the question we still need answered. And OT7 gave us a little bit of hope on that, and the Elite 11 gave us a lot of hope into that. And so going into this senior season, I think that's a big point of emphasis for Deuce Knight is how he looks how consistent is he as a passer, as a senior? But yeah, man, like we say with recruiting, it, it's not over until the signing day is done. It is not over until that pin meets paper. So, And again, it's something we touched on earlier. Mississippi Cats, do not leave Mississippi often. It's tough. So we'll see what Kiffin and company can do to keep uh, Deuce Knight in the fold. Yeah, I mean, a guy last year that that really shot up the rankings, A.J. Maddox, Ole Miss kept him home. Yeah. Yeah, um, AM made a, a hard run at him, and uh, Kiffin and company were able to stave off the Aggies. But uh, I looked it up just for posterity's sake. DJ Lagway, senior season, 72% completion uh, rate, 4,604 yards and 58 nice. touchdowns. Good. I pulled that out. I wasn't sure if that was correct, but I felt good about it. So thank you for I, confirming. But I knew the, it was, what was his junior one? Do you have junior numbers? Um, if not, I can try and pull him up too. Cause I, I know his junior statistics. I'm pretty confident. were not like otherworldly amazing. Here you go. I'm gonna see if I can find it right here. Um, but that was a big thing with DJ was being like, dude, we just need to see it. Look, junior season, he threw for 66% completions for 2,081 yards, 24 tutties and five picks. So he threw for like almost triple the touchdown. <laughs> Yeah, I kept um, I kept seeing yeah. all the 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 box scores for him every week. And oh, I was, absurd! I, I was like, this is a absurd. Type. 
yeah, he, he's a he was legit playing like college football 25 in real life. Just yeah. Destroying people. Yeah. Um, so uh, last thing before we get out of here uh, real sure. quick, um, you did write a, uh, as you coined it, a love letter to GMs <laughs> in college football. Um, yeah. Uh, everybody can find it at on three.com. You can go on Twitter and uh, follow Cody at Cody Belair. And he's got it pinned on his profile, but just kind of your, what, what, what kind of drove you to write this and then kind of your, your, I guess, takeaways after you sat back and, and read yeah. it after you were done. Yeah. I mean, it really is. I said this when I was doing the interviews with all my people, but it's so funny. Cause like with the thing that drove me to it was, initially when james blanchard who was my old boss at uh texas tech with joey mcguire um when he signed that extension I, I he got offered a good amount of scratch from usc and it was one of those deals where he goes to texas tech and joey mcguire understood the value that james blanchard brings to that program and james was making 210 000, i think and he got almost double when he signed his raise um, for his extension. It, and now he's making 400 grand. And when he, when I talked to him about that and all that good stuff, I was like, this is, this is so beyond deserved. And Bl I remember when Blanche, I was talking to him about it. He was like, this is just the beginning. And I was like, yeah, that goes for everybody. Right. I mean, like finally someone's getting paid what they're worth. And then yeah, Courtney Morgan at Alabama who came from Washington USC offers him nearly a million dollars. And Courtney says, no, thank you. I'm going to remain loyal to the guy that brought me here. And they break him off, and he's now the highest paid GM in history, making 825 grand a year, which is insanity. And the thing that you look back on, or the thing that I look back on, like I got my career started in 2015 in player personnel. My boss and the guy that got me going is a mentor to me is Austin Thomas, who the Ole Miss folks know because he was there with, with Lane Kiffin, and that's how he got his career started. But when Austin Thomas signed to be the director of player personnel or GM at LSU in 2016, he was the first SEC GM in history and was making $115,000. That was eight years ago. It's not like that was the 90s or like the early 2000s. No, this was less than a decade ago. The highest personnel staffer in the best conference on the planet was making 100 grand, just over 100 grand. And now the best conference with the best GM is making 800,000 plus. To see that journey from when I literally got started to like where I'm at now, and to see the sport and the position grow is something that guys like me and people that are in those positions in personnel and recruiting offices, we've just wanted to see that for so long because the value those people bring is unprecedented. And I'm, I'm the thing that I was so touched and it made, it made me sort of like, I really is a love letter because those are my people. I mean, I love everyone in the personnel community. And it's just something I'm so passionate about and seeing coaches stand on the table for their people is, is unbelievable. And it honestly is the beginning, right? It, it's a testament to James Blanchard and Courtney Morgan and the trailblazers in the personnel field, right? Guys like Ed Manowitz, guys like Matt Dudek, guys like Mark Pantone, guys like Austin Thomas. Those are the original godfathers of the personnel world. And the fact that everybody gets to eat now is just amazing. And it's just so refreshing as a guy that started out in those offices cutting tape and, you know, understanding just how much knowledge those people have. And I'm, I'm so glad they finally get broken off and rewarded for all that work. Yeah. I mean, going to the symposium was pretty eye opening to see kind of like, these are the, you know, th these are the, the, the lifeblood of college football here. These are the people that are, that are down and dirty in the trenches working hard yep. for, uh, for all these different programs to reap all the benefits on the recruiting trail and in the portal and NIL and all that. So, um, so yeah, really good, uh, really good read there um, from Cody. I encourage you to go 
go uh, give it a once over, um, just kind of uh, yeah. all encompassing like your journey and kind of how it's all changed. Uh, it's, it's titled the evolution of personnel departments leads to massive pay raise for college football GM. So yeah, good stuff there. Um, Appreciate I enjoyed, it. I enjoyed reading it because yeah, I mean, it's still kind of foreign to me. I mean, I, I know a lot more about it now, you know, working with you and, and going to the symposium and talking to people, but yeah, it's, it's very cool to, uh, to see all these people get rewarded. Cause I mean, you know, you came up from, you know, you got it out the mud in that industry where it's, <laughs> it's not very glamorous in the very beginning. No. And, and, you know, and the thing that I, I wish I was able to touch on more, and maybe that's a, a road that we go down at some point, the group of people that sort of suffer the most in this is the group of five schools. And we talked about that, I think, the last time on our show, because not only do all of the group of five general managers and personnel directors have to carry the weight of NIL, transfer portal, film evaluations, roster managed scholarships, they got to do everything else that these power four and blue blood programs get other staff members for right compliance if, uh, on campus recruiting. Some group of five directors of player personnel and general managers have full-time staffs of two to three people, maybe max. And they're having to do all the work in terms of support staff and off field functions that are going on around the program. And they get paid the least of anybody. They get paid the least out of any person on recruiting staffs in the country, and they do more work than any of them. So it's sort of a crime in that side of the, the disparity between group of five and power five football, but that's a conversation for another day, I think. But ultimately, the thing that I think is important to, to focus on is the fact that, you know, I think we're seeing a turn, right? I think we're seeing, the, the, we're turning the corner on the value of personnel and off-field staff for coaches because a lot of coaches, you know, I, I think I touched in there, like the first director of player personnel ever in college football was in 2007. And it was Jeff Collins. Like the Georgia Tech Jeff Collins was the first DPP under Nick Saban. And that's sort of where we started. And the fact that we have coaches now that have gone from player or, you know, started their coaching career with personnel people in the building is a game changer completely because we're still phasing out coaches that grew up and have developed and been molded without personnel or off field staff ever in the building. And now that some of these coaches understand the importance that these people have and have been developed and see like from the ground up, how much value those people bring to programs. I think you're going to see more and more coaches invest into these positions. Speaking of uh, bringing value, I uh, do want to remind you show also brought to you by our good friends at Roback. Uh, go check them out, roback.com. And uh, when you do use promo code juice for 20% off. And um, speaking of uh, even more value, home field apparel, they are scrambling to get those VIP boxes back because they flew off the shelves. Um, when they are back, make sure you jump on it and get one. Uh, the Ole Miss box features designs from 1988, 1997, some cool stuff there. The uh, coaches' jackets come out this weekend as well, which they put out a little promo, and it looks really good. Um, so if you want to get a little throwback, a little dazed and confused look there, the coaches' jackets are cool. Um, when you go to home field, whether you're getting a box, a coach's jacket, or just getting a t-shirt, use promo code last dance 24, you get 15% uh, off your first purchase. And finally, our guy Drew Moak in USA Benefits Group, um, bringing value to, uh, to healthcare. You can cut those health insurance premiums by 20 to 30% when you call him today, 601-953-8449. Or go to usabg.com slash D-M-O-A-K and get your free quote. Um, Cody, as always, pleasure. This was uh, enlightening. And um, look, I, I learned something new every time you come on the show. So we appreciate <laughs> you. Well, you're one of my favorites to talk to, Zach. I appreciate you having me on here. Absolutely. That is Cody Belair on three. Uh, scout and analyst. Um Busy, busy man as uh, the 25 class is, I don't know, how close are y'all to being done with the 25 class? Dude, we, we're just excited that high school games are getting back going. 
you know, we finally got new tape to watch. I've, I'm so over 2023 season highlights. So I'm, I'm ready to dive into some 2024 stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, him and uh, Charles power working hard to uh, get those, uh, the scattering reports and, and break down some film. So uh, you can follow him at Cody Belair on Twitter. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the handle right there next to uh, his lovely face. Give him a follow. <laughs> he's uh, he's one of the best in the business. But uh, that will do it for the flagship. Uh, we appreciate everyone tuning in. Appreciate all the sponsors making it possible. We will have a uh, another podcast this week as uh, everybody's favorite hit that line is back. We will break down week one and uh, give you some uh, some winners to pick for uh, the opening of college football. Five straight days of games. Woo! We made it. We're here. Can't wait. My couch is ready. My couch is prepared. (laughs) Yeah. I I was going to say, it's kind of counterintuitive, but like as the kids would say, we outside. Um, So we're we're, we're back. So uh, that'll do it for for Cody over there. I'm Zach. This has been the flagship. Until next time, guys.